Well, this evening, what I would like to do is to continue our series in doctrines and passages of Scripture that are badly misunderstood. And what I'd like to do tonight is preach a, a, a sermon that I would like to entitle, Untangling the, the Favorite Texts of False Teachers. Untangling the Favorite Texts of False Teachers. And I've chosen three passages of Scripture that are most commonly abused by false teachers uh, and I would say not everyone who has preached these texts in this way is a false teacher, uh, but they are wrongly preaching these texts if they preach them in this way. And so uh, it would be not only calling out false teachers, but maybe some, some good teachers who've not thought carefully enough about what these passages actually say. So tonight, we want to look at three passages which are commonly abused, and they center around uh, Christian giving, tithes and offerings. Now, I'm not preaching tonight on how we should give. I've done that before. Um, we should give generously. We should give sacrificially. My personal conviction is though we are not required to give a, a tithe, I believe that Christians should uh, strive to, if able, give at least a, a tithe of their income because if that's what God expected of ancient Israel, then that would be an appropriate standard for us. But we certainly are not held to a law of tithe the way that ancient Israel was. Now, I'm not teaching on that tonight, so it's really all I want to say. Uh, if you have that question, if you've not heard me teach on that before, uh, I'm not against the concept that Christians should give 10% of their income if they are able to. Uh, as we'll see tonight, we shouldn't expect the very poor uh, or those who are in great financial need to necessarily give that, but certainly if we are able, we should give generously. However, what I want to look at tonight are texts that are abused by false teachers in which they really try to manipulate God's people into giving more and more and more. And so I would like to choose what I believe are the three most commonly abused passages. Let's begin in Malachi chapter 3. You will notice this text. It will jump off the page at you. Malachi chapter 3. And here is a passage of scripture uh, which no doubt you have heard a sermon on before. And I'm not here to condemn every pastor who has preached um, this text in this way. Um, I'm not saying that their entire ministry is bad, but if they preach this passage of scripture in the way uh, that is so commonly done. They, they did misuse the passage indeed. I want to look at Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 through 12. Malachi 3, verse 6, we read, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me. And I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed God? How have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down on you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer, the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy you, the, destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Now, this passage certainly does teach us about giving. But the way that it is often preached is simply ripping it out of its biblical context, twisting it around, and trying to make it say something that it was never intended to say. And whenever we look at a passage of scripture, whatever the passage is, we need to read it in its context. We need to ask the question, who wrote this passage of scripture? Well, it's obvious the prophet Malachi wrote it. Who wrote it? When was it given? Uh, it was given between about 450 and 400 BC. What's going on in ancient Israel at that time? Uh, well, the people had been carried off into exile and brought back into Jerusalem. And after the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, many of the people were not faithful in carrying out all the commands of the Mosaic Covenant uh, in their worship, 
and also in giving of their tithes and offerings. And so in the book of Malachi, we see that the people and even many of the priests were unfaithful to the Lord and not keeping the old covenant that God gave through Moses. When we read about the tithes, as I've taught before, there were three tithes in ancient Israel. And the tithe that this text concerns is not a tithe of money. That's the first thing to note. This text has nothing to do with a tithe of money. There was a tithe of money in ancient Israel, but that's not what this is about. This text, as we can see very clearly, was about a tithe of produce, of grain, of oils, of, of the things that we grow from the ground. And so whereas you had tithes of money and you had tithes of livestock and you had tithes of Grain, the tithe concern in Malachi chapter 3 is a tithe of grain. Now, I don't know about you, but I've not tithed, um, you know, off of my produce lately. I, I don't presently grow very much. I had a few tomato plants this year, but I didn't bring 10% of my tomatoes to church and put them in the, in the storehouse at the church, which was the law under ancient Israel. Are you following me? When they grew crops, they had to take 10% of them and annually they had to bring them to the storehouse in Jerusalem so that the priest and the, the Levites and then from the Levites who would give a tithe of the tithe that they received, uh, the priest would eat off of the tithe of the tithe. But we covered all this in the sermon about giving and, and, and the ancient tithe system and how we're not under that system today, but it does give us some, some general principles that we should follow, and it does show us uh, that God does expect us to give generously, no doubt. But this passage here tonight, if you just read it, it's very clearly talking about tithing off of produce, off of what you grow. It's not about a tithe of money, and yet I've never heard Kenneth Copeland or, or one of these famous, you know, word faith, send me all your money, plant a seed, give me this, 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 this seed offering, uh, this, this, this gift, and, and God will make you rich. I've never heard them preach this text saying, you know, it's talking about tithing 10% of what you grow. Um, we don't do that anymore today. We're not under the Mosaic Covenant the way ancient Israel was. And so it's very clear that the primary application of this text was to those who were under the Mosaic Covenant, we can learn things from this text, but this text and the tie that it speaks of does not apply to us directly. We learn principles from it that can teach us about what faithful giving looks like, but the tithe of grain and oil and all that you grow is not something that we have to do anymore. That is no longer observed ever since Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. So for the last 2,000 years, we don't do this. And that's just clear as we read the text. Usually the text is, we begin to focus on it in verse 8. Will man rob God? And so Israel is being disobedient to God and the prophet Malachi throughout the book of Malachi calls out the nation of Israel, what's left of Israel living in what was the former land of Israel uh, in the area around Jerusalem. He's calling out the people for their disobedience to the Mosaic Covenant and among them, God says, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. They, they were not giving God what was due to him. They were not being obedient to what they were to give to the Lord. But you say, how have we robbed you? How have we robbed God? In your tithes and contributions. Now, once again, there are three types of tithes. And so the first question we should ask is, what tithes are we talking about here? All three, one of the three, it becomes very clearly very clear. Verse 9, you are cursed with a curse. What in the world are we talking about? You are cursed with a curse. Well, if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 27, you will see that there are a series of curses that would be placed on the people and the nation of ancient Israel if they did not keep the commands of the Mosaic Covenant. And this is speaking of the curses that would fall on the specific nation of Israel if they did not keep the laws contained in the Mosaic Covenant, specifically the ceremonial law, laws concerning sacrifices and tithes and what you can eat and wear and all those sorts of things that we don't observe today because living after Calvary, we don't have to do those things. You have a question? That's okay. Uh, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 27, 
Um, there is a passage which concerns the blessings and the curses that will fall on the nation if they do not obey God. And it is, uh, a, it is a long passage. Uh, do, well, it starts in 27, 28, actually, is what I was thinking about. Um, chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 to 14 concern the blessings for obeying the law of Moses for the nation of Israel. And then Deuteronomy 28, 15 to the end of the chapter concern all of the curses that will come on the nation. And just go home and read that because I have a lot of material to work through tonight. But these are the curses that are being referenced in Malachi 3. The curses of Deuteronomy 27 and 28 are what Malachi is talking about. Now, you know, these famous TV preachers, they probably don't even know that. I mean, honestly, they're, they're in the business of bilking people to get them to give more money. They're not really concerned about sound hermeneutics of how we should interpret the Bible and sound exegesis, only preaching what God's word says and not foisting something on the scripture that it does not say, but pulling out of scripture its meaning. That's what the word exegesis means. It means to, to explain, to, to take out of the Bible what the Bible says and nothing more. To only preach what scripture says and not to take away from it or add to it. That is what we do when we practice exegesis. We are pulling the meaning out of the text and nothing more. These, these people who abuse this text are not concerned with sound exegesis. They're probably concerned with getting people to give more money. Now, the Bible teaches us a lot about how we should give financially, but Malachi 3 is not a text that directly addresses that. There are other texts in the Bible which do that. But this one is about the curses that came on ancient Israel when they did not keep the grain tithes that they were, they were held to under the law of Moses. And so it says, you've robbed God in your tithes, verse 9, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Now look at verse 10 carefully. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse. The storehouse, yes, the storehouse at the temple. These were large barns where food was kept. Now, these are not storehouses where cash would be kept. This is a storehouse where grain, oil, crops of various kinds would be kept so that the Levitical tribe and the priests from that tribe would have something to eat because the tribe of Levi did not have land of its own to grow things on. And you can look at that in the book of Leviticus and I won't go into why the grain tithe existed except to sum it up and say the grain tithe was there so that the tribe of Levi and the priests who served in the temple had food to eat, okay? It was to support the Levites who served in the temple and their family. It was to support the priests because uh, they worked in the temple, they didn't work in the field, and so they and their families had to have something to eat. And when the people did not bring in the grain tithe and bring it to the storehouse at the temple, the, the priests and their families didn't have food to eat, okay? And so that is the issue. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, which is a place where the food was kept, that there may be food in my house. I, I mean, it's amazing that we miss this. We, we think this passage is about putting money in the offering plate when it says it's about bringing food to the storehouse, which we don't tithe from our crops anymore. We're not held to the grain tithe of the of the of the ceremonial law of the Mosaic Covenant. We, we don't do that anymore. We, we, you don't have to get 10% of your tomato plants uh, and, and bring them to church. I mean, you can come and bring them to church and I'm sure people will take them, but you're not required to do that like you would have been in ancient Israel. It says, if you do this, it says, thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of house, hosts, excuse me, and if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down on you a blessing until there's no more need. What was their need? They were starving. This was a time of famine. Now, false teachers will say, if you will give a tithe, if you will give 10% of your income, God will pour out financial blessings on you and you will have no more need. That's not what this text says, ladies and gentlemen. It says, if you will give 10% of your crops so that the tribe of Levi and the priests and their families have food to eat as they serve in the temple all year, then God will allow it to rain so that your crops will grow and your family will have something to eat. It's simply God pr promising to provide food. He's not promising to make you rich if you write a check for 10% of your income. I'm not saying you shouldn't give, 
financially. I'm just saying this text isn't even about that. And when a preacher tries to make it about that, he's misusing it. He's, he's twisting the scriptures to make it say something that here is not even of uh, here is not even addressed. It's not the concern of this passage. Thereby put me to the test, and I will open the windows of heaven. What does that mean? God will let it rain so that their crops will grow. Verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer. Now, some people say, oh, that's Satan. God's going to rebuke Satan, so he'll stop making you poor. The devourer is the locust. The devourer are pests that were eating up the crops. And God is saying, if you will be faithful to me, I will take away the, 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 the locust and all the pests that are eating up your crops so that they can grow. It's just the plain meaning of the text. So that what? So that the devourer will not destroy the fruits of your soils and the vine of the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. I mean, is it not obvious when you read the passage in its context and sit back and think about what it says that, that it's not really about what people make it about? Now, once again, I'm not, I'm not saying that you shouldn't give to your local church faithfully. You should, but this passage does not teach that if you give a tithe that God will make you rich, which is what many people say it, it teaches. And it also doesn't teach that if you don't give a tithe that you'll be under some sort of financial curse. That fanciful doctrine is not found anywhere in scripture, ladies and gentlemen. You should give faithfully, but not because you expect to get anything in return. Let's move to a text in the New Testament which does teach us about how we should give, and yet it is twisted as well to say things that it does not. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Now I have taught on this before, so if you've heard it before, bear with me. There are some who have not, and I want to cover it quickly. If you want to look at what the New Testament has to say about giving, the best place to go is 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. There you will find that God expects us to give sacrificially. He expects us to give and support our local church. The, an amount is not given. We are told that we should give as each has decided in his own heart. Not according to what we do not have, but according to what we have. In other words, God doesn't want you to give to the point where you can't afford to feed your family or pay your light bill. God doesn't want you to do that, okay? And there are even some wicked false teachers who will say, well, you just need to, you just need to give to my ministry, send in your seed, faith, offering, and, and, and God will make sure you have enough money to pay your mortgage, and then those people don't get the money and they have their house foreclosed on, and they will have to answer to Christ one day for what they have done uh, in praying off of the poor in the way they have. This passage says that you should give generously, you should give sacrificially, but only according to what you have, not according to what you do not have. And then in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6, Paul sums up his teaching on Christian giving. And we do want to see what it says about Christian giving, but then we want to also see how this text is twisted to say something that Paul never intended. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6, Paul says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Now, the specific gift that he was asking them to give was a, an offering which would support missionaries who were planting churches throughout the ancient world and spreading the gospel. But, but this speaks to how we should give in general. The specific context is they were trying to support missionaries 
who are planting churches, but this applies even to supporting our local church as well. This is just a, a text which teach us, teaches us about Christian giving. And so this would be the passage to go to, to answer the question of how much should I give, how should I give, and so on and so forth. Not Malachi 3. This text addresses those questions directly. But how do false teachers use this text? I'll tell you what they use it to say. You've probably heard this yourself. They will quote, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And they'll say, hey, you give little to God, and he'll give little to you. You give a lot to God, and he'll give a lot to you. The more you put in the offering plate, the more money you're going to have. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not what this passage says. That is not what it says. And anyone who says that is twisting God's word and abusing God's people. What is the harvest he is talking about? You sow. When you give, you are sowing. What is it that you reap? If you read 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, it is clear it is a spiritual harvest. And the point is this. You give a portion of your hard-earned money for the growth of God's kingdom. You give to your church and to missionaries to support God's kingdom because you want to see a portion of what you've worked so hard for used to expand the gospel and to bless God's people and the ends of the earth as the gospel is brought by God's people to the ends of the earth. The harvest that is spoken of here is not a financial harvest. And that is plain in the text. It is a spiritual harvest. In other words, you need to give to support missionaries so that they can bring the gospel to other people. Not that you will get anything in return except the satisfaction of knowing that your gift made it possible for someone to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone in a foreign land. Praise God, amen, that is the blessing you will receive. God is not promising you a bigger check than the check you put in the offering plate. It does say that God will provide for your needs in this passage. It does not say God will make you rich if you give. It just says God will take care of your needs if you give. God will not let you starve. It does not say God will make you rich, wealthy, healthy, prosperous. You are not promised that in scripture. You are promised that God will take care of your daily needs and provide you with daily bread. Look at what it says. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. There is the amount you should give as you have decided in your heart. You give, you ask yourself the question, what does God want me to give? How much should I keep for myself and how much should I give to my local church and ministries that I want to support? That is a question that we must each decide in our heart between us and our spouse if you are married and God. And that is to be, stay between you and your spouse and the Lord. You don't need to go and tell other people what you give. It is between you and God. Do I think that we should strive to at least give a tenth of our income if we are able? Yes, if that's what God expected people under the old covenant to do, we should try to at least do that ourselves. But are there people in poverty who cannot afford to do that? Yes, and the next text we'll look at addresses that very thing. Each must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Notice what Paul says. You don't have to do this. You don't have to give. I've never heard TBN preachers say, by the way, you don't have to give this offering. It's only if you want to give it. Don't give reluctantly or under compulsion. Don't do it because I'm making you feel like you have to do it. That's their whole stick, right? They want to make you compelled. They, they want to make you feel like you have to do it or you're not... You're, you're, you're not a good person and God's not going to bless you. Paul says, only give if you want to give to God's kingdom work. Now, is it a sin not to give? Yes, it is. But Paul says, God is not going to be happy with your gift unless you give cheerfully because you want a portion of what you've worked so hard for to be used for God's kingdom. Verse 8 says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you. If you will be faithful and give, God will make all a grace, grace abound to you. Well, what does that look like? Does it mean getting rich? No. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. You give to the Lord and God will take care of your needs. It doesn't say God will make you rich but he will make sure you have daily bread. He will make sure you have clothing. He will make sure you have a place to live. He will take care of your needs. 
but he doesn't promise you a Corvette or Ferrari or a big fancy house. He doesn't promise you those things. He just promises you the basics of life. He will provide daily bread. He doesn't promise any more. That's what the passage says. Going on, it says that in verse 9, he quotes from the Old Testament. It says, he is distributed freely to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. God takes care of the poor. Verse 10, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and the increase of harvest of your righteousness. Why does God give you, uh, why does God allow you to earn a paycheck? Why does God give you financial blessings? So that you will be able to give a portion back to the Lord for the increase of his kingdom work and, and the ministry of his church. This passage is used by false teachers to say, hey, the more money you give, the more income you will have. It does not say that at all. Rather, what this passage says is you must give as you have decided in your own heart between you and God. Do not give because you feel like you have to. Give because you want to. Give cheerfully and you will see what you give used in a spiritual harvest by God to spread the gospel in your community and in the world. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why you should give to your local church. That's why you should give to foreign missions because you want a portion of what you've worked so hard for to be used for God's kingdom work. Don't give because you want to get something back other than the joy of seeing people come to Christ and seeing his church grow. Beyond that, you should expect nothing more in return. That's what this passage teaches. Lastly, the passage which is abused the most often, it's found in two places in the Gospels. It's found in Luke chapter 21 and the end of Luke 20. But I want to turn to where it occurs in Mark 12 because it's the longer version of the story. It's almost identical in Mark and Luke's Gospel, um, but Mark has a few more details of what happened in this story. So let's go to Mark chapter 12. And I need to give credit where it is due here. Um, I first heard this passage taught on where this was shown to me in a sermon by John MacArthur called Abusing the Poor. You can watch it on YouTube. Search Abusing the Poor. And it's a John MacArthur sermon where he explains this passage from the Gospel of Luke, but it's the same essential passage in Mark 12. And um, it's a very good sermon, and I'm going to give you a synopsis of what this passage says. You will notice it immediately, and I want to read it to you, and I want to remind you of how it's used, and then I want to show you what it actually says. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. And he, speaking of Jesus, he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples and said to him and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Now what do false teachers and some well-intentioned teachers who need to be more careful in how they use God's word, how do they often use this text? How is it usually preached? It's usually a, a, a passage which is used to say, you need to give sacrificially, you need to be like the widow. She gave all that she had, and it was more than the rich people. And that is true. Jesus says what she gave was a far greater sacrifice than the rich people. But the application which is so often made from this text is you need to be like the widow. You need to give so sacrificially that you give all that you have. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not what this passage of Scripture teaches. The passage does not say that you need to give the way the widow did. What does it teach then? I'm glad you asked. Let's back up and get a little, you ready for the word? Context. Context is key. Go back to Mark 12, verse 38, and look at the verses which come right before this story, and it will help you understand the point that is being made by Jesus. Mark 12, verse 38, and in his teaching, Jesus said, 
beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feast, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive greater condemnation. Now, among all the things that Jesus condemns the scribes and Pharisees for in these verses, one of the things he says that they do which is so evil and wicked that they will they will answer for on judgment day and face a greater condemnation is that they, verse 40, devour widows' houses. What does Jesus mean? That the scribes and the Pharisees devoured widows' houses. It means that widows who were poor, they took what little they had so that they could be richer. They abused the poor. They literally used religion as an opportunity to extort money from the poor. And what Jesus is saying is, is that these false teachers, like so many false teachers who can be found on TBN and other places today, extort poor people and they take people who have little while they themselves are so rich and they get them to give as much as possible, even their last penny. Jesus says those people are exceedingly wicked because they prey on the poor so that they can be richer. They devour the houses of widows. And there was hardly a person more destitute and poor and more in need of help than a widow in ancient society. They didn't have social security back then, ladies and gentlemen. Widows most often depended on charity for their survival. So verse 41, after condemning the scribes because they devour widows' houses and take advantage of the poor, we read in verse 41, and right after Jesus said that, he sat down opposite the treasury in the temple and he watched people putting money into the offering box. And many rich people put in large sums and we know that they would often ring bells when they would give this money and oh, look at how much I'm giving. I'm so generous to God. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, you shouldn't do that. When you give, it's between you and God. Don't tell anyone about it. Don't don't brag about it. You give between you and God alone because the people who give so that others will see them give already have their reward. You give in secret and your father who is in heaven will, will reward you because he sees what you give in secret. These rich people put large sums of money in the offering box where everyone can see. Verse 42, and a poor widow. Now that word was just mentioned in verse 40 about how these people devoured widows' houses, how they took advantage of widows. And two verses later, into the temple walks a poor widow widow and she came in and put in two small copper coins which make a penny it was worth about the modern equivalent of a penny and it was very little money says in verse 43 and Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them truly I say to you this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. These rich people, they give out of their abundance. They have so much money. And yeah, they gave a lot of money, but they have so much more that they're keeping for themselves. Jesus is saying that the rich people weren't making much sacrifice. The poor woman made a huge sacrifice. But then look at what he he says. Verse 44, for they contributed out of their abundance, but she contributed out of her poverty. She has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Do we really think that God wants a poor widow who has nothing to eat and only has literally, not metaphorically, literally one penny to her name? Do we really believe that God wants that widow to give her last penny and then starve? Because that's what happened to this woman. This woman had nothing left. And Jesus just finished saying that what these people did was they extort money from the poor so that they can get even richer. And what do so many modern false teachers do? They use this text, 
which condemns those who extort the poor and they use the text to do the very thing that Jesus was condemning them for. They preach this text and they say, you need to be like the widow. Even if you don't have much, you need to give all that you have. And the whole point of what Jesus was saying is, don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees who extort the poor, and yet so many of our popular preachers on TV today get up before millions and say, you need to send me your last penny. You need to send me everything you have because you need to be like the widow. No, what Jesus was saying is, is don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees, and there are so many modern popular preachers who are just like the scribes and Pharisees who Jesus condemned and even worse because they prey on the poor so that they can be even richer. Ladies and gentlemen, that text is not about you giving your last penny. If you literally only have a penny to live on, God does not need your money. What you need is you need some help. You need God's people to reach out to you and love and, and, and help you. You don't need the rich to extort your last penny out of you. And that is not what Jesus intended in that passage of scripture. And it impugns the very grace, mercy, and character of God to use this text to say such a thing. And so I know that many well-intentioned preachers have used this text to talk about how we ought to give sacrificially. But ladies and gentlemen, when you read it in context, that is not at all what Jesus is trying to say. What are the lessons we should learn from this? Well, number one, we should read our Bibles carefully. And just because we've heard a passage preached a certain way our whole lives doesn't mean that it's right. We need to read it carefully. We need to read passages in context. We need to be careful not to read into the Bible something that's not there. Because I bet you've heard at least one of these passages preached in the way that I've shown you is wrong tonight, right? I bet plenty of you have seen that. Maybe all three of these passages, as I've seen many times. Ladies and gentlemen, when we read God's word, we handle it reverently as what it is, the very word of God given to us for our teaching and our edification that we can hear God speak through the scriptures. We do not twist the scripture. We, we, we do not try to make it say something that it does not say. It's God's word and we are supposed to take God's word and read it as God's people and only say and teach what it says and nothing more. Not twisting it, not adding to it, not taking away from it. We must be very careful when we use God's word to teach. James said, not all of you should assume to be teachers, brothers, because teachers will be judged much more harshly. Amen to that. And some people will see Jesus on judgment day and he's going to say, why did you twist and pervert my word to extort the poor? That's never what I intended. We should have a greater fear of God than that. We should use God's word carefully and faithfully. And we try to do that here at our church. And I pray that when you read scripture, you would read it with open eyes and an open heart, only reading what it actually says. Let's pray and then we'll have a few questions. Father, we come this evening thanking you for your word. And Lord, I just ask that you would help us to think carefully about how we use scripture. Lord, we certainly see in your word that we need to give generously and faithfully to support your local church and your ministries around the world through your church. And Lord, we want to do that. But Lord, may we never be like those shameless peddlers of false religion who extort the poor that they can be rich. How sick and evil, how blasphemous of a thing it is to do that. And Lord, we know that they will answer to Christ on the day of judgment and they will receive their just condemnation. Lord, may we never be like them. May we be faithful to you and your word and only what you have spoken. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.